Bom, vamos então, uma vez que o, o seu Vice-Reitor declarou aberto, vamos dar início às palestras. Eu pedia ao professor Hélder Miguel Fernandes que venha aqui para a mesa, porque vai ser ele o moderador desta sessão da de, de tarde. E teremos então, esta tarde, quatro palestras. Teremos as duas primeiras, a que se segue um breve intervalo com um coffee break na entrada e depois as duas restantes. Um, vou apenas dar aqui as boas-vindas aos colegas americanos, já que durante toda a cerimónia de abertura não, não foram, não ouviram uma palavra em inglês. So, I would like to welcome our fellow American friends. Thank you for being with us. Um, We had the formal and typical opening ceremony, and right away we will start with our presentation. So, Professor Alan Hutter, would you please step up? Portanto, vamos então dar de imediato início à primeira apresentação do Professor Alan Hutter. Okay, good afternoon, and uh, I'd like to take a moment again to uh, thank the organizers of the meeting for the invitation to be here with you today. Um, again, I, this, we arrived yesterday to Portugal. This was my first time to Portugal, and uh, uh, it has been a great experience. Uh, the, your campus is beautiful, and uh, again, looking forward to spending a little bit of time with you. Um, I am a professor at uh, Appalachian State University, which is in Boone, North Carolina, so in the southern part of the United States. And what we would like to do or in the next, uh, I guess, 30, 45 minutes or so, talk to you a little bit about um, an area that uh, certainly is an issue in sport. Uh, that's the area of dehydration. But I would also like to talk to you uh, a little bit about some of the research that we've been involved with uh, at Appalachian State over the last 20 years, uh, primarily in, in combative sports uh, and sports that have a weight classification. So prior to that, um, I'd like to just do a brief overview of, of the importance of, of hydration and health. I think most of you uh, here understand that our body will survive just a very few days without, uh, again, without essential water requirements. And, and, and again, uh, on the, a little bit longer, we can survive uh, without, without ingesting food. So hydration is very important to overall physical health. Uh, on average, we as humans uh, will we'll turn over a, a relatively large amount of water per day, two to three uh, liters per day in a 24-hour period. And again, without uh, sufficient replacement of fluid, obviously you, you place yourself, and athletes in particular, place themselves at, at a significant health risk. Uh, we see a number of uh, acute issues from a safety standpoint, uh, most commonly in, in prolonged physical activity, primarily in the heat, and then certainly in clinical conditions, of, in, in the cases of diarrhea, uh, gastrointestinal illness, we see cases of Uh, dehydration secondary to, to, uh, to illness. <clears throat> Again, um, once an individual becomes significantly dehydrated, we'll talk about that in particular greater than, than three, four, five percent of, of body weight. This then predisposes the athlete or the individual to uh, health-related illnesses such as heat cramps, heat exhaustion, and, and possibly even heat stroke. And again, without uh, appropriate fluid intake, uh, th these uh, dehydration can obviously lead to, again, more severe conditions, cardiac uh, abnormalities, arrhythmias, renal dysfunction, uh, electrolyte management, uh, and then certainly uh, without um, urine production, this could lead to volume overload, renal failure, and then possibly electrolyte toxicity. I think everybody in here realizes the symptoms that have been associated with dehydration. Probably we've all experienced symptoms secondary to dehydration. Uh, again, increased thirst, uh, dry mouth, uh, skin uh, reduction in elasticity of your skin, headaches, nauseous, dizziness, 
lightheaded, uh, altered mental status, etc. Uh, yesterday when I arrived here in Villarreal, it was three in the afternoon, and I wanted to, to get my run in, and I decided to go for a run. I was experiencing many of these symptoms at the, at the end of my run, so it's very common, uh, again, to, when exercising in the heat. Um, who's at greatest risk? Again, I think you're, you're familiar with this. Certainly the elderly, uh, again, uh, athletes, um, the military, uh, certain jobs that require individuals to be exposed to the heat for extended period of time. Uh, all of these uh, specific populations are at risk to dehydration-related uh, uh, illness, both from a health standpoint and then certainly <clears throat> from a performance standpoint. Now, let, let me talk to you just a little bit um, about, uh, that's kind of a brief overview of, of uh, again, kind of the, the adverse consequences of significant dehydration. Let's talk about now, I want to share with you a little bit about some of uh, the research we've been doing in the, in the area of weight management and sport. Uh, primarily, I would like to talk to you about sports that have <clears throat> a weight classification associated with them. I think most commonly, we're talking about uh, combative sports, judo, wrestling, uh, what's become very popular, mixed martial arts, um, again, where the athletes have to meet a weight requirement prior to competition. So again, uh, a number of these sports are in the Olympics, and we hope they will stay in the Olympics. Um, in 1997, this is actually now 15 years ago uh, this year, uh, we had three college wrestlers uh, tragically um, uh, lost their life. They died while engaging in weight loss. So these were athletes that were intentionally losing weight to meet a weight classification so that they could then compete. And uh, this happened uh, in a three-month period. It was the first time in the history, and wrestling is a very old sport, the oldest sport actually in the world. Uh, some people argue that it's running. I'll argue that it's wrestling. Uh, we had three athletes tragically and preventably die. The United States government at that time <clears throat> uh, immediately launched an investigation into this um, and uh, to, to look at the cause. Uh, again, prior to this, we had never had uh, death in the sport of, of wrestling. The governing body for collegiate wrestling in the United States is the NCAA. That's the National Collegiate Athletic Association. Immediately, they mandated um, a, a comprehensive weight certification program to hopefully prevent, prevent uh, any future deaths in the, in the sport. Um, and again, that was instituted uh, immediately. And then the following year, the entire program was instituted. <clears throat> Ironically, it took about nine years um, before that program was instituted at the high school level for younger, for younger athletes. So it took, uh, it took about a nine year period before that program was instituted. I'm going to talk to you a little bit about uh, this particular program. So the goal <coughs> was prior to the competitive season in the sport of, of uh, wrestling in particular, the athletes would have their body weight measured, they would be assessed for hydration, and they would then be assessed for body composition to calculate body fat. Now the goal for this um, was to establish a minimal weight. So in other words, a safe weight in which the athlete could, could, could get to. So the goal would be based upon the body fat value, uh, we could calculate a minimal weight for the athlete to get down. Prior to that, the athletes could lose uh, 10, 20, 30 kilos, there was no, no, regu there was no regulations. But now we were going to, to, to institute a minimum. And, and certainly part of that is to develop a safe weight loss plan. It, you know, can we lose, can we teach athletes to lose weight safely? Is there such a thing as safe weight loss? Is there such a thing as unsafe weight loss? And we want to teach the athletes if they have extra weight to lose, and it's appropriate for them to lose weight, can we do that safely? And certainly give them daily nutritional goals to meet 
their, their recommended weight loss. So the regulations were quite straightforward. After we did the body composition assessment on the athletes, we would then calculate, based upon their body fat, a minimal weight associated with a minimum percent body fat. So for young wrestlers, that was 7%. That's for high school age, maybe ages 14 to age 18. <clears throat> From ages 18 to 24, that minimum was 5%. So if you had an athlete who was 20% body fat, we would calculate their weight at 5% body fat and tell them, okay, this is a safe weight for you to get to if you want to lose weight. And then certainly for women, which again, typically have higher body fat percentages, that minimum was 12%. Prior to um, doing the body composition assessment, we wanted to ensure that the athletes were hydrated. So one of the measures we would do would be to take a urine sample and, and simply measure their urine-specific gravity, and that if their urine-specific gravity was below 1.025, um, they were considered hydrated and, and they could proceed with the assessment. If the athlete showed up in a dehydrated state, and they failed the hydration measurement, they were not allowed to be evaluated. By the way, wrestling is the only sport uh, in, in the United States where athletes have to go through a, a, an assessment of body composition and hydration prior to being allowed to compete. It doesn't happen in any other sport um, in, in the United States. And then if the athlete had excess body fat, they had you know, five, seven, eight percent you know, extra, so maybe their body fat was 10, 11, 12, 13, and they, need, they had extra fat, we, we would develop a weight loss plan no greater than 1.5% of body weight per week. So that's, again, you know, you're talking about a one, one to two pounds of weight loss per week. And then again, a nutritional program to meet those weight loss goals. Now, I want to just mention a little bit here about how we measure hydration. Um, again, we're talking about evaluating hundreds of thousands, you know, maybe 300,000 athletes at the high school level and the collegiate level in a relatively short period of time. So we can't go take a blood sample on all, on all of these athletes to measure plasma volume or hematocrit or plasma osmolality. We can't do that. It's not feasible. We have to do a hydration assessment in a quick and relatively valid uh, way to do that. Uh, and so right now, uh, the, the, the only field test that we have for hydration is uh, looking at, at urine and looking at the concentration of urine. Right, so if urine is concentrated, the, the specific gravity is going to be higher, and, and then, again, it's a quick method. But it's still an, it, we still have to have a biological sample, um, and I'll talk more about this. So uh, we, we have a, a test strip where we can, we can use a, a reagent to look at that, or we can use a light refractometer. The refractometer is considered a, the gold standard for the field testing. It's not a gold standard from a laboratory perspective. From a labor laboratory perspective, we want to take plasma and, and evaluate the osmolality. Um, the, rent, the cost of a refractometer is somewhere between 240 to 550, that's US dollars. And the, the strips average about $40 for a package of 100. But again, these are disposable and they're only used one time. Um, here are uh, just photos of each. That's a light-free test. You can, you can measure the specific gravity of every, anything, any fluid, Coca-Cola, wine. It doesn't matter. If you're interested in the specific gravity, you can evaluate. And these are, are the test strips here. And, and again, if you want a quick, valid field measure of hydration, all you need is a very small urine sample to evaluate uh, hydration. As I mentioned earlier, if the athlete is above 1.025, um, that's at the collegiate level. The, the, some people argue that, it, that it, you know, it, it doesn't need to be quite as high. 1.020 is used in, in some states. Um, you know, the consensus is you're above 1.020, you, 
the athlete's significantly dehydrated. <clears throat> and again, in, 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 the, in the case of wrestling, if the athlete gives you a urine sample and they're dehydrated, they, they, you stop. You don't even measure their body fat. You send the athlete home, tell them to rehydrate. They'll have to come back the next day to, to be evaluated. So again, if they fail, they come back in 24 hours. So in preparation, we tell the athletes, you know, drink fluid. Drink fluid before you come to have your body composition evaluated. What, what we were seeing is that some of the, the wrestlers were actually intentionally dehydrating prior to the assessment. And, and if, if you weren't assessing their hydration, <clears throat> their minimal wrestling weight was going to be lower because they were coming in in a dehydrated state. So again, here, uh, just looking right, if, uh, again, a simple way to monitor your hydration is to, to look at the concentration of the urine. It, it should be relatively clear. Uh, this, if this, was in, uh, this is wine, but if it was a glass of urine, I don't recommend drinking this. Uh, it's completely sterile. It won't hurt you, but uh, not a good idea to, to consume. Uh, this athlete would, would have a urine-specific gravity, probably 1.025, 2.6, 2.7, is dehydrated. And, and again, urine should be relatively clear. Uh, now, there are factors that can, that can cause false positives. Uh, if the athlete is taking uh, supplements, many different types of supplements, uh, these can show up, obviously, in the urine. Um, but but uh, generally, we're, we're looking for a clear, uh, not, a, not a lot of particulate matter in, in, in the urine. <clears throat> One of, uh, for those students that are interested in doing research, um, I understand many of you are in graduate school and uh, one of the areas that we need more research in is coming up with a quick, easy, non-invasive measure of hydration. We don't have that. Um, we need to come up with an accurate, valid, quick way to measure hydration. Um, and again, I, uh, whoever comes up with this instrument uh, is going to be very profitable from a financial standpoint, but we need it from a health, from a sports medicine standpoint. We need to be able to measure athletes' hydration quickly. And, and right now we can't do that. We have to, to, get, to have the athlete uh, urinate in a cup or we have to get a blood sample. Some of the work that we've been doing uh, from a research standpoint is using different biotechnologies to assess human hydration status. And this particular study, um, uh, we looked at ultrasound, so the speed of sound and how, how fast sound wave can, can pass through tissue, fat mass and fat free mass. And we, we in particular wanted to see if ultrasound could, could be influenced by hydration status. And we published that data in 010. Um, this is a prototype of the instrument. Uh, again, you, you theoretically could, could send the sound wave through any tissue in the body. This happens to be the calf muscle. Um, but we found, again, in a dehydrated state, we were able to detect a change in, in ultrasound uh, in sound, ultrasound velocity, the speed of sound as it transverses through the tissue. Now, we, we don't yet know what the numbers mean. We're trying to figure this out, and we're continuing to do some work on, on this. But this is, for example, one, one area. Another project with a different company, uh, we, we used bioelectrical impedance analysis. And by the way, I'll be talking about both of these because you can use both of these technologies to measure body fat. But now we're talking about measuring hydration. And here we were looking at um, electrical current. And, and again, and we were in particular measuring the impedance to that current as it travels through the body. We were looking at multi-frequencies, different frequencies of current. Uh, again, in theory, right, the, the higher current can, can penetrate the intracellular fluid. The lower current stays in the extracellular fluid. So the idea is that we, if you use a high and a low frequency, you can get a better estimate of total body water and therefore a better estimate of hydration. And this is the same principle that bioelectrical impedance analysis uses to measure body composition, right? Because, because we know water, um, lean body mass is high in water content. And if we can estimate that total body water content, we can estimate fat-free mass and therefore percent body fat. We published this data in 2012. And again, 
This was a company, um, I believe they're out of California, InBody. And this has um, eight electrodes, two on the feet, two on the hands. And, and so the current is going, it's a whole body impedance value. The current's traveling from the lower limbs to the upper extremities and back through. And you can actually evaluate eight different frequencies of current. And what we were able to find in this study um, was very similar to what we found in the ultrasound in that both of these technologies can detect changes in hydration, which is significant. Now, we have to figure out now what they mean. You know, we have to be able to come up with thresholds. So both of these areas are uh, open for future research. Now, there are other technologies out there. There are some companies trying to use a saliva, a test strip uh, on your tongue. Uh, I, I've talked to one company about using a, a, a near infrared light source, possibly going through the retina, the eye. To, uh, again, so there are newer technologies, but it's an area where, again, we need more research. So, uh, and, and the, uh, again, once we get there, well, it's a constant challenge. <clears throat> now, um, the other uh, area of interest is body composition. So theoretically, once an athlete is able to pass a hydration test, we then want to measure their body composition. And I think most of you in here are familiar with the different ways to measure body fat. And there are many. We have field measures, such as skinfold calipers, bioelectrical impedance. And then we have some more laboratory-based techniques, like underwater weighing, uh, air displacement, uh, the bod pod. Uh, these are all approved methods in the United States to assess the body composition of the athlete. Um, these have all been approved by medical advisory committees. Um, and again, the NCA approves all of them with the exception of bioelectrical impedance. The NCAA feels like we need more data. So this is actually an area where we, we could use some additional data in addition to hydration. So when we want to measure body fat in 300,000 athletes, again, it's the same idea. We need, uh, we need a method that is valid, reliable, but quick and easy to do. So we, we, we can't theoretically bring all these athletes into the lab to do underwater weighing, to do DEXA, to do bod pod. It's, it's impossible. We have to go into the field. So we, uh, the, the two most common measures are certainly skinfold analysis and bioelectrical impedance analysis. Um, <clears throat> certainly the individuals that are doing these types of testing with 300,000 athletes, again, have to be trained. Uh, again, certainly if it's skinfold techniques, they have to have proper training in skinfold. And you can see the average cost of a skinfold caliper is relatively cheap, 200 to 250 US dollars. <clears throat> Here is a, uh, an example measure. Primarily, in the, in the athletes, uh, depending upon male or female, we're doing a three-site skinfold analysis and then calculating body composition from there. Um, here is another bioelectrical impedance device. This is based out of this company. We did uh, a validation study on this instrument. So one of, the, you know, one of the things that we have to determine first is if we're going to use a piece of equipment, is it valid and is it reliable? How does it compare to a gold standard measure like underwater weighing with measured residual lung volume? And we validated this. We, we did a validation study. And we found a prediction error that was very similar to skin folds, about, uh, about 3% of, of body fat. And this uses a single frequency. It's only the lower extremities. So the current is it's a 50 megahertz uh, uh, frequency. It's only, only in the lower extremity. But we found a, a relatively low standard error of estimate. And, and again, this is quicker than doing skin folds. And you don't have to. Um, you don't have to have any special training. Um, it, basically, you push a few buttons. This is a company uh, based out of Japan. Uh, Tanita is the name of, uh, of the, so there are quite a few companies out there. Um, again, I, I would encourage you, if you're using technology to measure body composition, and most of you are working with athletes or will be, um, you, you need to make sure that the products have been validated. Ask for validation studies. Have they been published? We, we publish this in medicine, science, sport, and exercise. So look to see if the instrument has been validated. Um, 
against a gold standard measure. Uh, again, something, this is our underwater weighing system in, uh, at Appalachian State. This is, a, we have three different load cells that, that take about 1,000 readings per second, uh, which is then interfaced up into a computer. Uh, and again, we would then measure, measure residual lung volume. Uh, this is one of the gold standard measures that we have in our lab. We uh, also have a DEXA. We have air displacement. Uh, but, but again, the field measure should be validated against something like, like this, this measurement here. <clears throat> This is the bod pod. I think most of you have seen air displacement. Uh, we also did a validation study for this company when uh, early on. Uh, this company was based, um, it was Life Measurement Incorporated, based out of California. This company now has been purchased by Cosmed uh, and now uh, is out of Rome, Italy. Uh, this technology was developed by NASA. Uh, the idea here is we're measuring now, instead of water displacement, we're measuring air displacement. And you can see we have some uh, uh, pressure transducers that are found here. And we can measure the amount of air that's being displaced. And again, when this technology was compared to underwater weighing, uh, in, we, we did a validation study of, of college age wrestlers. I think we had 80 in that study. There was no difference between, between the two. So again, can, now, now this is starting to be recognized as a gold standard measure within the body composition testing um, arena. These are on the magnitude of uh, 30, I think $30,000, something higher, Dr. Collier, uh, 35,000, so they're not cheap. Uh, so a little bit more. How, how many have worked with a bod pod? Has anyone in here worked, done work with no, nobody? Um, this is very interesting technology. Again, this is a different ultrasound company. Um, this company was out of uh, Los Angeles, California. A again, using ultrasound, this is an ultrasound device to measure body fat. So uh, again, the idea is that we're measuring that sound wave as it goes through the skin, the subcutaneous fat, the lean tissue, and uh, it'll go down. That, that sound wave will hit the bone and bounce back. And we can measure the, the, the time the time frame, and based upon that time frame it takes to transverse those tissues, we can then estimate, estimate body density and therefore body composition. So we, and this is very simple. Um, we, you do it at the same locations as, uh, as skin folds, triceps, subscap, abdomen, and, and again, when compared to underwater weighing, uh, found a, a variability similar to skin folds. So there are some um, states in the United States that are using this technology instead of skin folds to measure body fat in, in the athletes, because it's quick. You put a little gel on the end of the ultrasound probe, you send the, it's, it's very fast. <clears throat> the name of this company is uh, Body, Body Metrics. And again, we, we uh, published that paper, I think was Medicine, Medicine Science. You know, once you do the data, uh, collection for the athlete. We then put all the data into a, cent an, into a web based program, very simpler, simple to, to do, and uh, we, we get a lot of useful information the, the body fat value, how much fat weight the athletes have, fat free weight, and then we calculate their minimal wrestling weight and uh, again give them a weight loss plan. So once you do the information, you put it into a, a database, a, a, a web program, and then the athlete has results extremely quick. And what's important here is now we're giving the athlete some guidance. Okay, they need to lose weight. What's the safe, what's the lowest allowable weight that athlete should, should get to? <clears throat> the most recent study that we did, and I'll just talk a few minutes about this paper, um, was moving away from the wrestling community to mixed martial arts. How many of are familiar with mixed martial arts? Raise your hand. No, a couple of you. Anybody in here competes in mixed martial art? You, you compete and you do this fighting? Okay, so we have a few that are. So um, what we did in this study is that we wanted to evaluate uh, there was anecdotal evidence and, and uh, that athletes were dehydrating intentionally in mixed martial art fighting to meet, to meet their weight, weight class requirement. 
Uh, we just published this paper, by the way, uh, if you're interested in this area, uh, just uh, not too long ago in the Journal of Strength and Conditioning Research. I think everybody realizes mixed martial art is exactly that. It's a sport that requires different techniques, boxing, uh, Muay Thai, Judo, Brazilian Jiu Jitsu. Uh, the first event was held in the United States. Uh, one of the, the main uh, organizations, uh, UFC, ult ultimate, ultimate Fighting Competition, the first one was held in Denver, Colorado in 1993. Soon after that, this, it was banned. They, they were not, the, the government shut it down in part due to uh, violence and, and health issues. At the time of the first event, the fighters were fighting without any protection on, on their knuckles. They could use their elbows. Uh, th there, was, there was no rules. Um, again, after it was banned, uh, they st the, the organization, uh, MMA organizations, worked with local governments to make rule changes. And, and now uh, it's legal uh, in, in the majority of the United States and the majority of the world. Uh, North, in North Carolina, the state where Appalachian State became legal in 2007. Uh, <clears throat> again, very similar to wrestling, uh, the athletes are required to, to meet a, a, a weight class, a specific body weight. And, you know, similar here, uh, uh, again, there, there seems to be, or we, we heard anecdotal evidence that, uh, again, that there were problems with acute dehydration. Um, again, in the wrestling community, it's been shown that if you mandate a weight class, this is going to lead to, uh, again, acute dehydration, rapid bo body water loss, acute rehydration just prior to competition. <clears throat> When the collegiate wrestlers died in 1997, they were attempting to lose anywhere between about 7 to 10 percent of body weight in approximately a 24-hour period. So think about that. Take your body weight, calculate 10 percent of that, and try to lose that amount of weight in 24 hours. Uh, it's extremely difficult to do, and in the case of these athletes, um, they, they lost their life doing this. Again, the report by the government uh, came out, by, this is the Center for Disease Control in 1998. And as I mentioned, this led to rule changes. Um, and, and we, um, at that time, the NCAA contacted a couple of us who were doing work with the wrestling community. And uh, we were asked to evaluate the effectiveness of the new program, the weight management program that I just explained and we evaluated the athletes over a six-year period and found that uh, the athletes were losing a significantly lower amount of weight. So we were going from basically uh, an average of eight pounds, that's an average, down to two pounds. So somewhere from four kilos down to one kilo as a result of going through this type of program. So again, in the sport of MMA, what happens is that the athletes weigh in around 24 hours prior to the competition. So they have about a 24-hour period to rehydrate. Uh, in the sport of wrestling, it, it, it at one time was 24 hours. One of the rule changes that I didn't mention was that they decreased the amount of time between weigh-in and competition from 24 hours down to two hours. So again, if you're trying to gain 10 kilos of water, you can't do that in two hours. It's very difficult to do it in 24 hours. But in MMA, the athletes have 24 hours to rehydrate after weight loss. So we had, we had heard of anecdotal evidence that the athletes are losing a significant amount of weight. There was no data on this in the published scientific literature. And currently, there are no guidelines or rules to minimize rapid weight loss in fighting. It's very common. It's not regulated by governing bodies. So the purpose, again, here's a photo of MMA. Uh, again, now we have women fighting. Uh, we, we, our purpose was to look at the extent of dehydration. We, we measured weight gain, how much weight the athletes gained in that 24-hour period. 
uh, and, and how dehydrated and how rehydrated they became. <clears throat> we looked at 40 regional fighters. So these were fighters from the state, uh, the states of North Carolina, South Carolina. Um, they were male and female. We had the majority male. I think we only had two female fighters, although female fighting is becoming uh, extremely popular. Now in the United States, the champion in female is an Olympian. She received a gold medal in judo. She's undefeated and hasn't been, beated and, uh, hasn't been beaten in, in competition yet. I think she's 8-0. Oh. Um, it's interesting, the challenger, uh, because she was a gold medalist in judo, they're saying she can't be beat. There now is a woman from the state of North Carolina who's 7-0. and oh. She received a silver medal in wrestling in the Olympics. And uh, th there's talk that the judo and the wrestler will fight. Uh, it'll be very interesting to see who wins. Um, but the, but the, the, the goal, again, uh, the only requirement is that they have to go through a physical, a pre-fight physical, which is very uh, basic, heart rate, blood pressure. Nobody is looking at how dehydrated the athlete is prior to stepping into the ring. And as we'll talk about, um, if athlete is seriously dehydrated, one, it's going to impair performance, but what effect does taking a blow to the head have uh, when, when you're dehydrated? We have absolutely no data on this. So again, another an area of, of research is what effects certainly uh, dehydration has on performance and health within uh, this particular sport. Here's some data simply on the subjects. You can see there, there were novice. Their average experience was about five years. The mean age was about 26 years of age. This is just a little bit on, on the methodology. I mean, the, the bottom line is that we took the data uh, basically 24 hours prior to the fight. We measured body weight. We measured hydration using urine-specific gravity. And then we evaluated them two hours before the fight. So 22 hours later, we measured them again. And we wanted to see for the athletes how much weight were they losing? Were they dehydrated? And can they rehydrate in that 22-hour window? Here's one of the athletes here being evaluated. Again, most athletes are very lean, somewhere around 6 to 8% body fat. And uh, we, we did all the measurements in a competitive uh, environment. So all the testing was done prior to an actual fight. <clears throat> Again, this is simply looking at uh, urine-specific gravity. Here are some of the results. So what, what did we find? The bottom line was during that 22-hour period, the athletes uh, lost and then regained a significant amount of weight on an average of a 4.5% of, uh, of uh, their body weight and somewhere on the, on the magnitude of uh, about four kilos of body weight. So these athletes were significantly dehydrated prior to the fight, 1.028. Remember, the cutoff is 1.020. Prior to the fight, they, they, as a group, returned to baseline, but you can see the average is still 1.020, and these were significant changes both in the amount of weight. We had one athlete uh, one athlete in that 22-hour period gained 20 pounds, so that's 10 kilos, 10 kilos. Think about changing your body weight 10 kilos during that time period. It's very difficult to do. This athlete actually had intravenous fluid, had an IV intravenous fluid uh, all night to, to, uh, to, uh, to meet, uh, to, to rehydrate. Here's some data I'll, I'll just highlight. Um, again, if you look at the athletes out of our 40, um, about 40% 40 of them were either significantly dehydrated or seriously dehydrated. So 4 out of 10 were entering into the ring dehydrated. Significantly, not, moder not moderately, not minimum, significantly dehydrated. Again, um, this was, again, the first data set to our knowledge to document the amount of significant dehydration in MMA fighters, uh, certainly immediately. And, and again, what did we find? We, you know, again, uh, we're, we're looking at they're, they're using acute dehydration to meet their, their weight class. 
in our study, again, only 23% of the fighters were well hydrated just prior, just prior to, competi to, to competition. So again, we had a significant group that were seriously dehydrated. So again, I think from a, a research standpoint, those of you that, that uh, are interested in research, again, um, you know, what are the health risks associated with competing in a dehydrated state and in the case of a combative sport like MMA? Certainly there's a case of cardiovascular strain. Uh, in, the, in the case of athletes that are taking physical uh, blows to the head, we're looking at, at possible, certainly the, does the risk for concussion go up, traumatic brain injury. Um, again, we, we know that uh, uh, cerebral spinal fluid is diminished because the water is coming from somewhere. Uh, postural instability, uh, decrease in, in reaction time, neuropsycholo neuropsychological function, uh, and, and total brain volume. And, and so again, all of these are not good. Um, and, and ultimately, I do not like to make predictions at all, but I predict that a major health event will happen in MMA, and it won't be due to the fact from an athlete getting hit in the head, it'll be due to the fact that the athlete was competing, either intentionally losing weight to meet a weight class, which is completely avoidable, or an athlete will be taking a, a, a shot to the head in a, in a dehydrated state. So I think, uh, again, I don't like to make predictions. It's very difficult to do. Uh, nobody ever thought in the sport of wrestling three athletes would die in a three-month period, all completely avoidable. Um, I think that, uh, again, we're going to see a problem in MMA. Uh, unless the governing bodies of MMA decide to make changes on the ex how much weight athletes are losing. Again, we had one athlete 20, 20 kilos. Uh, and, and I've heard stories where it's more than that. Um, so this is an area that is ripe for research. Um, and again, I think what's been fun about, about this type of work uh, is that uh, as an exercise scientist, you have an opportunity to provide data to governing bodies that then can make rule changes to make the sport better, to make the sport better from a competition standpoint, but also from a health and safety standpoint. Uh, later on in the, in the year, in October, I uh, have been invited, uh, been invited to go to Las Vegas to speak to the medical community. This is the American Association of Ringside Physicians. They're in charge of providing medical support for MMA. The physicians are seeing that there's a problem. They've asked me to come in and uh, talk and, and provide a recommendation as to how to fix the problem in mixed martial art fighting. Um, Again, I think the American College of Sports Medicine, they have a position stand for wrestlers, and the position stand is very good. I think if you're working with any athletes in weight classified sports, I think the, uh, using uh, these recommendations, uh, you know, discouraging extreme environments, uh, developing uh, some legislation to minimize unhealthy rapid weight loss, um, making athletes go through a body composition assessment, and then having uh, cooperation between the coaches, between the, the physiologists, between uh, dieticians. Uh, again, uh, mo by the way, most athletes get information not from exercise scientists. Most athletes are getting information from, from their coach. And a, their coach may or may not have formal training in exercise physiology. Uh, so to, to make sure that, that the athletes have knowledgeable information easily accessible to them on how to lose weight and how to lose weight correctly if they need to do it. Okay, I'm going to uh, skip through because uh, I know I'm short on time. Um, by the way, I, I was going to talk to you a little bit about the American College of uh, Sports Medicine also has a position stand on exercise and fluid replacement. Uh, it's a very good document. Uh, again, if you're working with athletes outside of, of weight class, this is just a guideline for any, any athletes in sport, an, an excellent uh, document for your reading list. I was going to go through some of that, but I'm, I'm short on time. Um, again, these are, and I've mentioned a number of these in my talk, these are a number of the different companies that we've worked with at Appalachian State and, and developing new technologies uh, for the area of hydration, body composition assessment. Um, again, uh, Dr. Collier and I, uh, 
uh, and a number of us here are involved in an uh, international PhD program in exercise science. Um, if, ex if you're accepted into the PhD program, part of the program, you can come and do work in, in the laboratory at Appalachian State. Um, you'll hear from another one of my colleagues later today. But certainly, if any of the research that he, you hear about is interesting to you, uh, please feel free to chat with us afterwards, and we can talk to you about some of, of the research that we're doing. Um, I'm at 45 minutes, so I'm going to uh, now just stop, and uh, I will entertain any questions that you, that you may have. Thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Helen Hunter. You may join me. Okay. Um, antes de mais, uh, gostaria de dar duas informações prévias. Antes de começarmos com uh, o painel de questões, o primeiro é de que o livro de datas, uh, com os resumos um, e também a tradução em português das conferências que estão a ser proferidas em inglês, que já está disponível no site do evento, logo se vocês tiverem algum equipamento informático, poderão acompanhar uh, através do resumo em português. Um, também gostaria de informar que o programa de hoje, que vocês têm na vossa pasta, embora tenha unicamente três conferências, na verdade são quatro. Okay? Daí iremos fazer duas conferências, seguida do intervalo, e depois um, retomaremos com a terceira e a quarta conferência. Relativamente ao Dr. Alan Hunter, permito-me, antes de mais, um, ele é doutorado pela Universidade de Pittsburgh em Fisiologia do Exercício. Atualmente é professor no Departamento de Saúde e do Exercício da Universidade do Estado de Appalachian. É membro uh, e consultor do ACSM, todos vocês conhecem, Colégio Norte-Americano de Medicina Desportiva. E foi durante 10 anos responsável pelo workshop dessa identidade, que é responsável pela formação dos profissionais da área do exercício e da fisiologia do exercício nos Estados Unidos. Um, eu vou fazer somente um pequeno resumo da conferência dele. Ele abordou questões associadas à desidratação e à sua influência na saúde, bem como as consequências inerentes à perda e à gestão do peso. Um, abordou de uma forma muito específica a temática da gestão do peso e da desidratação no âmbito da prática desportiva, nomeadamente no contexto de prática do wrestling. O wrestling é uma modalidade com muita expressão no ensino médio e superior nos Estados Unidos, da América, mas que, obviamente, as conclusões do estudo que ele apresentou poderão ser, obviamente, transportadas para outras modalidades associadas à luta e cuja prática é baseada em categorias reguladas pelo peso corporal dos atletas. Também integrou na sua preleção as questões associadas à avaliação e ao controle da desidratação, bem como da composição corporal, citando e enunciando diferentes testes e métodos de avaliação que podem ser utilizados no local de prática, de competição ou no contexto do laboratório. Perante estas informações, eu passaria então às questões que vocês quisessem colocar, poderão colocar em português ou em inglês, obviamente. Um... Sim. Sim. Uh, o Dr. Alan Hutter perguntou se haveria aqui lutadores de artes marciais mistas. Julgo que é uma, uma boa oportunidade para colocar em questões abordarem um pouco da vossa experiência. Sorry, Alan, I was looking for the microphone. Oh, no problem. I have one question. Um, 
I know that in, in wrestling, you have been for some years in USA doing that type of control of the athletes and uh, trying to prevent the, the, the changing of weight classes. Mm -hmm. uh, do you think that it, it will be in the near future possible to do that with MMA fighters? What is the, what is the, the obstacle? What? Yeah, I think this is a very good question. So in, uh, in wrestling at the, in the United States, at the collegiate level and at, at the high school level, wrestling is regulated by uh, large organizations, uh, the NCAA or the state high school athletic associations for a given state within the United States. So it's tightly regulated by the organizations. Now in MMA fighting, uh, MMA fighting is also regulated by organizations. Um, the, the challenge is, uh, will the organizations think that it's important? Uh, that's the question. Now, uh, in, in the sport of wrestling, they really didn't feel like it was that big of an issue. However, when three athletes died in a three-month period, they then made changes. I, I think what's going to happen in MMA, I may be, again, I don't like to make predictions, but I think what it's going to take, unfortunately, is a death. Um, I, hope that it, I hope that changes will come prior to that. It would be nice uh, to see changes enacted, and, and these are the recommendations that I will make uh, when I present to the physicians at, in the meeting in October that, that changes should be made. Now, what's different about MMA and wrestling, in MMA, the athletes are being paid. In collegiate wrestling and high school wrestling, the athletes aren't paid. So when you introduce payment, uh, it, it makes it more complicated. And you also have promoters and marketers, so it's very different. Um, it's a good question. Uh, my recommendation would be to institute a program very similar to what we're doing with collegiate wrestling and MMA. Give the athletes a, a minimum weight that they can get down to. Right now in MMA, if an athlete weighs 200 pounds and wants to fight at 130 pounds, they can do it. But it's, uh, it's not regulated, so it, I'm anxious to see what happens. Good, very good question. Good afternoon. Thank you very much, Dr. Adder, for the presentation. It was very interesting. And during the presentation, you invited also the students that are interested in research to do research, especially in mixed martial arts, since there is a new area which is not regulated enough. So I would like to ask you a suggestion for a student that wants to start doing research mm. on how to behave and relate to athletes in mixed martial arts, for example, that after a period of dehydration, they probably can be also not easily, not so friendly, because you collect data with these fighters in a very stressful situation. So probably it's not too easy to behave and ask them to uh, provide urine samples and to receive skin fold measurements. So probably uh, you have some good suggestion for these students on how to behave uh, with this type of athlete in these stressful situations. Yeah. <clears throat> and again, I think that's a, a great point. Um, whenever you attempt to work with athletes in a field, in a competitive environment, one, you have to have the permission of the coach and you must have permission of, in our case, the organizers of the conference, of the, of the, of the event. Without the administrative support and the, coach, the coaching support, the athlete will not do anything because they're listening to the coach. And, and it's very important to have the support of, of the coach and support of the, the organizer of the event. That's, one of, that's part of the reason why we don't have a lot of data on MMA fighters. Now, uh, you mentioned another point, the psychological state of the athlete. Uh, the athletes, right, we, we were measure, taking measurements on them two hours before fighting, two hours prior to competition. For those of you that are competitive athletes, probably you don't want to deal with this stuff when you're preparing mentally for competition. Uh, again, that's why it's extremely important to have the support of the coach and to try to make your testing measurements as simple, easy, and quick as possible. 
If we were, wanted to take blood on these athletes, the coach would have said no. You know, if we were to make the testing very invasive, time consuming, the coach would have said no. So the idea is to make the testing simple, quick, to have support of the coaching staff, have support of the organizing event. Um, and, and again, that's, it's hard. That's very difficult to do. That's part of the reason why we don't have a lot of data on MMA fighters. Again, to our knowledge, this is the first published data set on, on fighters. And again, we're looking just at one question. There's many different questions here to, to ask in the sport. Good point. Thank you very much. Yeah. Mais alguma questão? Dr. Helen, thank you so much yes. for your conference and for answering the questions. Okay. Thank you.